What's going on there, YouTube, and welcome back to another comic book video. All right, so we are going to do a full story video. A full story video is when I sit down, take a bunch of videos that tell one overarching storyline and combine them together into one big video. Now, today's full story video is going to be about X Factor, really. Let me explain. So, when it came to the X Men in the late 1980s, they began to bring us some great good old X Men events like the Mutant Massacre. But the second one, better known as Fall of the Mutants, was not your typical event. You see, you did have three different X Men teams X Factor, X Men, and also New Mutants. When it came to Fall of the Mutants, None of the three teams actually cross over with one another. They all had to deal with their own problems on their own. And so when it came to X Factor, they had to deal with Apocalypse on their own without the help of the X-Men nor the New Mutants. And so for today's full story video, it's going to be Fall of the Mutants, but only the X Factor chapters. And that's really it. So I do hope you enjoy today's full story video. See y'all at the end. What's going on there, YouTube? And welcome back to another comic book video. Alright, so we're going to continue our coverage over X Factor. And we're going to pick up with issues number 18, 19, and 20. Now, today's video is going to be about the idea of X-Factor fighting against the Four Horsemen of Apocalypse. Now, you may have noticed I said issue number 18, and the last time we saw X-Factor, it was about issue number 12 at the tail end of the Mutant Massacre storyline. The reason why we're skipping over a few books because those books were never re-released in a digital format for me to read. And so unfortunately, if I'm going to read those books, I have to find them in a physical format or read them illegally. And I'm not going to do either of those choices. Now, on top of that, those books were never collected either. Well, I heard an omnibus is coming out very soon, so possibly we can come back and cut those books down the road. But either way, we're going to go ahead and jump into the next story arc that I am able to read, which again is going to be Apocalypse sending out his three horsemen, not four yet, against X-Factor to make their days even harder. And so as we dive into today's storyline, we do pick up with X-Factor number 18. Now, the opening pages of this book kind of tell us what we have missed in those few books we had to skip over. For example, Iceman. See, there was a short period of time where he had disappeared from the book. And the reason why? Because he had a crossover with Thor in a two-part story arc where those two characters went up against Loki. The problem was, though, Loki had changed the powers of Iceman. Technically, power him up made him a whole lot stronger. But at the same time, Iceman is no longer able to control his powers. And so occasionally, he might actually freeze himself. And so our heroes have to go out of their way to unfreeze him almost every single time he tries to use his powers. Now there is something else we should mention, and that would be the idea of Richter. Richter was another mutant they were able to save in those few books we had to skip over. And when it comes to Richter, he has powers very similar to Avalanche, the ability to make earthquakes. And so he has been saved by X-Factor and they are going to begin the process of training him. Now there is two more things we have to mention here guys, and that would be Cameron Hodge. Cameron Hodge is beginning to show his true colors. The idea that he did not really join X-Factor to help out mutants, he really joined X-Factor as a way to build up the hatred in humans towards the mutants. And you see what I mean as we go through this book. But on top of that, Cyclops believes that Jean Grey is the Phoenix, and that is going to be very important in later parts of this chapter and the next one. Now, I do want to shift my focus onto Rusty and also Skid. 
two people who are currently being trained by X Factor who could sooner or later become superheroes like the rest of the X Factor team. Now remember, Rusty has the ability to control fire and Skid, she has the ability to create a force field around her body. Now the reason why I want to focus on these two characters is because they were introduced early on in the series, but they were able to produce a relationship with one another, which honestly is a great thing. But Skid is now afraid to fall in love. And the reason why, because she had heard the stories of Cyclops and Jean Grey, the idea that Jean Grey turned into the Dark Phoenix and became crazy. Now, let's not forget, in the earlier parts of our coverage over X Factor, we had learned it was never Jean Grey, that it was the Phoenix pretending to be Jean Grey while Jean Grey was actually inside some kind of cocoon healing up her body at the bottom of the bay. And so when it comes to Skid, she does not have the full picture, but she's still afraid of the idea that she might become the Phoenix and their love might possibly die as well. And so it kind of brings in more drama for these two characters. Now, later on in the day, we do pick up with Cyclops and Rusty having a training session with one another. Now, while the two characters are training, it does lead into a conversation about when Cyclops first realized that he was actually in love with Jean Grey. Now, while the two guys are talking, they don't realize that Jean Grey is there listening in. And so unfortunately, this conversation is going to break her heart. And the reason why, because you have Cyclops tell Rusty that at first, their love did not count because they were children. It was puppy love. But he realized when they got older that he really did love her. But the problem was though, it wasn't Jean Grey. It was the Phoenix. And let's not forget the big moment that kind of established their love took place in Uncanny X-Men number 132, but that was right in the middle of the Phoenix Dark Phoenix saga. And so, of course, it didn't count because that wasn't Jean Grey. It was the Phoenix pretending to be Jean Grey. And so you have Cyclops tell Rusty, at first, I truly did believe I was in love with Jean Grey, but now I don't know because that wasn't her. It was someone else pretending to be her and so he now believes their love is most likely not even real anymore and Jean Grey she hears that it breaks her heart and she runs away the problem was though she was carrying a bed with her mind that bed crashed on the ground Cyclops overhears the crash and realized that Jean Grey was there now while you have all three characters moving around well, Cameron Hodge is watching them, and this begins the process of us seeing how truly evil this character is. And what I mean by that is, when it comes to Cameron Hodge, he did not join X Factor to actually help them out with the idea of helping out mutants. Instead, he joined X Factor to build up the hatred towards the mutant race. Let me explain, because remember, when they came to X Factor, when they first came together, they told the world that they were a group of humans who were going out of their way to hunt down mutants to help out the human race. But in reality, they were a group of mutants mutants going out of their way to find other mutants who may need their help to learn how to control their powers. It was a new take to what Charles Xavier did when he first formed the X-Men. And so you had Cameron Hodge being the man in charge of their advertisement, their PR man. And so when it came to Cameron, he kept putting out commercials, say, if you need help, call in X Factor. The problem is though, every single new commercial is getting worse and worse with the idea of saying mutants are evil, mutants deserve to be destroyed. And when it comes to Cameron, he's lying to their face saying, hey, I'm only doing that so that we can get more calls and you can find more mutants. But in reality, he's like, no, I am trying to build up the hatred towards the mutant race. But on top of that, 
he belongs to a group known as the right. And the right is one of many groups that are trying to get rid of the mutants across the board. Matter of fact, Cameron is the leader of that group. And so while you have Cyclops talking to Cameron about his latest commercial, Richter powers go off. And when it comes to Richter, X Factor was able to save him from a small group of people that belong to the right. But Richter powers only begin to go off again when he saw Cameron. And the reason why, because he remembers Cameron's voice. He remembers that Cameron is the leader of the right. And so, when it comes to Cyclops, at first, he's wondering why Richter is freaking out, and he goes, talks to Richter. And Richter says, I remember that man's voice. I believe that he is the leader of the right. But before Cyclops is able to get more information, well, Jean Grey walks in, and she's wondering why the building is shaking. We know why, it's because of Richter, but she believes it's because Cyclops is freaking the kid out. Except you have Cyclops snap back at her saying, you have no right to barge into this room and question my methods on helping this young boy. You have no idea what we were talking about or what he is going through. Now Cyclops, he storms off. The building stops shaking because Leech is there. And remember, Leech has the ability to cancel out other mutant abilities. And so with Leech being there, Richter powers are brought back to normal. But you have Jean Grey tell Leech and also Artie to stay here at Richter while she go chase after Cyclops to figure out why in the world this man is having so many mood swings. And that leads into Cyclops going into the office of Cameron Hodge to log into Cameron's computer because Cyclops is starting to believe that Cameron is not really a good person, that Cameron might most likely be up to something. But the problem is though, in the middle of his computer session, the Phoenix appears. Now, this is where I'm going to explain something else we had missed when it came to the books we had skipped over. Because when it came to Cyclops, he went back home to Alaska to finally talk to his wife, Madeline Pryor, and his son as well. But the problem was though, when he arrived at their house, the house was completely cleared. But on top of that, his wife and his son have disappeared as well. And so he's kind of like, what happened to my wife and my son? But all the clues point to the idea that they have been killed off. And so for Cyclops, he is basically a broken man. And so now with the Phoenix appearing on his computer screen, he is truly believing in the idea that Jean Grey is the Phoenix and she is playing mind games on Cyclops. And matter of fact, let's not forget that Jean Grey was following Cyclops. And so she walks into the office and the projection of the phoenix disappears right behind Jean Grey. And so when Cyclops looks over and sees the phoenix disappearing, he believes that Jean Grey is the phoenix. Now something else to mention is that when it comes to Cyclops, the reason why he truly believes that Jean Grey is the phoenix because what happened back in San Francisco in the previous issues that unfortunately we cannot cover because apparently she used her powers to extreme heights and she was able to pull something off. And so because of that, Cyclops believes that Jean Grey is the Phoenix. But either way, while you have the two characters going back and forth using their powers against each other, you have Cyclops confess his love for Jean Grey all over again and talking about the idea of actually helping her become a better Phoenix this time. But you had Jean Grey say, I'm not the Phoenix though. Like I have no idea what you are talking about. But on top of that, you have Jean Grey say, you don't love me. You loved the Phoenix. Those moments you had where you thought you were falling in love with me was with her. And so now because you believe that I am the Phoenix, that you now have the chance to be with me again. That maybe this time everything's gonna work out. But honestly, it can't work out because you're not looking at me as me, you're looking at me as the Phoenix. 
And so you have the two go back and forth until Leech is able to arrive and use his powers to cancel out Cyclops powers and Jean Grey powers. And once that happens, you have Cyclops realize, oh my God, Jean Grey is not the Phoenix. Because at first he believed that it was her who stopped his optic blast, but it was Leech. And so that is the moment where you have Cyclops realize Oh, you're not the Phoenix. You're just a regular person. What in the world is going on? And once you have Cyclops realize that and look over back into the room where he was at Cameron Hodge office, he sees the computer is basically sending out a hologram of the Phoenix to trick Cyclops into believing it was the Phoenix. And once you have our heroes realize that this was a trap, or not a trap, but more something being done by Cameron Hodge, it begins to show that X-Factor cannot trust that man. And what is that man truly up to? We then jump over to Apocalypse. Now, when it came to Apocalypse by this moment, he only had three of his four horsemen. And so we see him talking to somebody and talking about the idea of turning that person into his fourth horseman. Here's the thing though, because this person had apparently almost died and he had saved that man's life. And now he will give the man the ability to have his powers back, but to also go after people who took his powers away. But as we dive into issue number 19, we do focus on Cyclops and Jean Grey again. And you have Cyclops kind of feel like his mind is completely broken. The idea that his wife and child are most likely dead. The idea that he let Cameron Hodge push him to the point to believe that Jean Grey was the Phoenix. But on top of that, Cameron Hodge is most likely a bad guy. He kind of feels like he should not be here until one, his mind is actually straight again. But on top of that, he, he feels like X Factor should break apart. It should disband because honestly, the entire operation is falling apart. Angel is dead. Cameron Hodge is evil. Cyclops cannot think straight. Iceman powers are currently not working right. Like nothing is going right for this team at all. But either way, when it comes to Jean Grey, she's trying to re-establish the idea of staying together and keep Charles Xavier's dream on. But for Cyclops, he can't do that because when it comes to Charles Xavier's dream, he will be so upset to hear that his students are out there pretending to be mutant hunters and not really just going out there helping out mutants in a better and easier way. And so for Cyclops, this entire team needs to fall apart now. We then jump over to Iceman and Beast. Now, when it comes to those two characters, they're also with Caliban. Caliban had joined X-Factor in those few books we had skipped over. He's kind of like replacing Angel, who is believed to be dead at the moment. And so when it comes to our three heroes, they were sent out into Manhattan by Cameron Hodge to look for Boom Boom. And Boom Boom was another new mutant who had joined X-Factor who was supposed to be training alongside with Rusty, Richter, and also Skid, and Leech, and also Artie. So they had a lot of trainees around this time in X-Factor comics. Either way, when it came to Boom Boom, she had disappeared. She just ran off. Matter of fact, she has her own book right now with a few other characters better known as Fallen Angels. And so while Iceman and Beast are looking for her, she's over there in that book having her own adventures. And we're not going to cover that series. But you have Iceman and Beast trying to find her. Now, while out there, they do run into a crowd of people who begin to hate on them because they realize that Iceman and Beast are two mutants. And this goes back to Cameron Hodge all over again because Cameron Hodge is putting out advertisements that are basically saying that mutants are evil. They should be killed off left and right. And so now the hatred towards the mutant race is growing even faster. 
Now, while you have Iceman, Beast, and also Caliban out there looking for Boom Boom, well, they have no idea that they are being watched by no other than Apocalypse. Now, while Apocalypse is watching over those members of X Factor, well, his three horsemen that he had recruited so far are fighting against one another to kind of see who is the most fittest of them all. Because remember, when it comes to Apocalypse, he's really big on the idea that if you are weak, you do not deserve to live. You deserve to be killed off. Only the strong may survive and leave the earth in a better direction. Now, if you are somebody that have been classified as weak, then Apocalypse will wait for you to at least try to show that you can become a strong person. But if you can't do that, then yes, he will kill you off. Now, with all that being said though, when it comes to Apocalypse, he kind of gets tired of his three horsemen fighting against one another to see who is the fittest of them all. And he says, look, if you want to prove something to me, go out there and fight against X Factor. And they do leave. Now, while they're leaving, you then have Apocalypse check in on the fourth person that he is slowly turning into his fourth horseman. And you had this person tell Apocalypse and us that he knows that Apocalypse is playing with the minds of his other three horsemen. Now, when it comes to Apocalypse, he's kind of like, yeah, I am. Why in the world would I deny that? Because matter of fact, I'm going to do the same thing to your mind once the process is done with you changing into my final fourth horseman, which is going to be death. Now, getting back over to Cyclops and Jean Grey, you have the two characters trying to teach Leech how to control his powers because sometimes his powers are really great and other times his power is not really that great. Because remember, Leech has the ability to cancel out other mutant abilities and that would be great if they're fighting against someone. But just imagine that you are about to die and your powers are the only way to save your life but Leech is next to you and your powers are canceled out and then you die. And so for the X Factor, they're trying to teach him how to kind of control his powers. Except while you have Cyclops and Jean Grey trying to teach him, you have the rest of the trainees run into the room to inform Cyclops and Jean Grey that Beast, Iceman, and Caliban are currently fighting against the three horsemen of Apocalypse. And so that leads into X Factor and also the three horsemen of Apocalypse fighting against each other. Now, while you have the two sides fighting against each other, you do have Cyclops mention the idea that these three horsemen are really proving to be an actual challenge for our heroes. Matter of fact, our heroes are having a hard time winning this battle. Now, while you have the two sides fighting against each other, you do have Cyclops tell Iceman to freeze the entire area around them, to basically hoping to freeze the three horsemen as well. Now, let's not forget, in the last chapter, we had learned that Iceman powers are technically not under his control anymore because he was in a storyline with Thor and Loki have gave Iceman a power up and with that power up well Iceman no longer has control of his powers and so if he does try to push himself too much he might actually freeze himself again and if that happens they might not be able this time to unfreeze him but for Cyclops, they have no choice. They have to go ahead and freeze the entire area, but to also save the innocent lives who could be affected by this battle. And so when Iceman does that, he does freeze the three horsemen of Apocalypse. And so it does look like our heroes have won, except you have Apocalypse go ahead and use the ability to teleport his three horsemen away. And so of course the bad guys got away now. But for our heroes, they also realize a crowd of people are forming around them. Now, when it comes to our heroes, they're hoping that this moment right here really shows that mutants are not evil. Because let's not forget that when it comes to X Factor, when they are wearing their regular X Factor clothes, they are pretending to be regular humans who are mutant hunters. But when they're in their mutant X Factor clothes, they go with the names X Terminators, a group of mutants who are out there trying to get rid of X Factor. 
but also trying to use that name as a way to prove that mutants are not evil. And so with the X-Factor team right now being looked at as X-Terminators, they're hoping the crowd of people will realize that they just went out of their way to save their lives from the three horsemen of Apocalypse. We then jump back over to the base of X-Factor. Now, when we do, we pick up with the trainees of X-Factor, who are making lunch for everyone who's part of X-Factor, and the main team has not come back yet from their last battle against the three horsemen of Apocalypse, but they're on their way back very soon. Either way, while you have the trainees making lunch, it does lead into an argument between Rusty and also Richter. And the reason why the two arguing is because what Richter had heard Iceman when X-Factor had saved him in those few books we had skipped over. See, when it came to Iceman, he said that mutants should only be judged by what they have done, not by who they are. And that is really, really important. Iceman is correct. Except when it comes to Richter, he said, how dare Iceman say that, but him and the others go out in the world pretending to be mutant hunters, only helping the idea that mutants should be hunted down. Because let's not forget, this period of time of Marvel Comics, mutants are beginning to see more hatred towards them than they ever did before. And so right now, what Richter is saying that what X-Factor is doing is not really helping mutants out. It's only making things a whole lot worse. And so you have the two characters begin to argue with one another. Now, here's the thing, because you do have Richter powers begin to kind of go out of control basically making a small earthquake. But luckily, X-Factor had just arrived back to the base. Now, when X-Factor comes back to their base, they got two people who are currently injured. First off is Iceman, because again, Loki had given him a power-up. And so because of that, Iceman is no longer able to control his powers, and he is basically freezing himself. And so they have to use Leech as a way to kind of cancel out Iceman powers so that he will not freeze himself over and over again. The other person would be Beast. And the reason why I'm saying Beast because in the last chapter, and I forgot to mention this, Beast got touched by one of the four horsemen of Apocalypse. And of course, that would be Pestilence, who has the ability to give someone illness some kind of random diseases. And so right now, Beast is fighting some kind of disease in his body. And so now X-Factor is down to members currently. And so you have Jean Grey, Cyclops, Caliban trying to help out Iceman and Beast and tell the other people, the trainees, hey guys, go ahead and leave the room and let us handle this. Now, the rest of the book, I really am going to skip over it so we can kind of go ahead and wrap up today's video. And the only reason why, because the last few pages of this chapter is really more of Rusty trying to help out the humans. And what I mean by that is, because Iceman went ahead and used his powers in the last chapter and froze the entire Central Park area, you have Rusty say that he should use his ability to kind of get rid rid of the ice to minimize the damage done in that area, but to also say like, listen, mutants can also be helpful, not dangerous. The problem is though, when Rusty is out there, he is technically caught in the middle of a gang group who are going around trying to hunt down different people who could possibly be mutants. And so when it comes to Rusty being a mutant, those gang members are beginning to come after him. Now, luckily for Rusty, he does get saved by Skid, Richter, and also Artie. Because remember, Artie has the ability to connect his mind to someone else's mind. And so when it came to Rusty, you had Artie connect his mind to Rusty's mind to realize that Rusty was in danger. Artie goes and gets both uh, Skid and also Richter to say, hey, Rusty is in danger. And the rest of the chapter is basically those three heroes coming to save his butt. 
but then at the end of the chapter you have Rusty being able to use his fire abilities to get rid of all the ice in Central Park but to also leave a message behind that technically says mutants can be helpful not dangerous and that is why I'm going to go ahead and skip the ending of issue number 20. I just want to make sure that we at least did cover what happened into it because as we jump into the next story arc, we building our way up to the fall of mutants and everything gets a whole lot more serious. But with that being said, What's going on there YouTube and welcome back to another comic book video. Okay, we are going to jump back into our coverage over X-Men comics that lead into the Fall of the Mutant story arc, the second crossover for the X-Men. This time, we pick up with X-Factor issues number 22, 23, and 24. And this is going to be our last video before we dive into that particular story arc. Before we dive into today's video, I do want to mention that down below in the description, I have the playlist linked in there just in case you want to go back and watch the videos before this one to get a better understanding of what is happening before diving into the big event. Matter of fact, each crossover we do is going to have a playlist of their own to keep things nicely organized. So for example, there's a playlist playlist for the mutant massacre as well and so getting into today's video we do pick up with x-factor being confronted by cameron hodge their pr person for their group now remember when it came to x-factor it was the original five x-men coming together to keep charles xavier dream alive the idea of helping out mutants and teach them how to control their powers, but to also have a day where humans and mutants can live together in harmony. Now, when it came to X-Factor, they had this bright idea to pretend to be a group of humans who were mutant hunters, who were helping out the human race. But in reality, they were a group of mutants who was using that to find mutants that they can help and actually teach. And so when it came to Cameron Hodge, his main goal was to get the word out there to the world. And matter of fact, it was his idea that X Factor does the whole pretending to be a group of humans. Either way, with him being their PR, he kept putting commercials out there that kind of spread the hatred towards the mutant race. And the idea of them trying to help out mutants kind of look bad on them because now they're known as a group of mutant hunters and more and more humans are beginning to hate the mutant race all because of these commercials. Now, you also had X Factor realize that Cameron Hodge is up to something, which we already know what it is. He's part of a group better known as The Right, another group in Marvel Comics that is trying to get rid of the mutant race. Now, in our last video, he had tricked Cyclops into fighting Jean Grey. And even though Cyclops has no proof it was Cameron who had tricked him, Cyclops and the rest of X-Factor knows that they cannot trust him. Now they're wondering why in the world did he come back to their base? And it's all because of Angel's will. Because remember, in the few books we had to skip over, we had learned that Angel had committed suicide. And so because of that, it's about time for his will to be released to everyone who was close to him. And so when it comes to Cameron, he is hoping that in the will, he had received something from Angel that could possibly hurt X-Factor down the road. 
Now, while you have the different members of X Factor getting ready to leave to go hear the will of Angel, we do see they're being watched by Cameron Hodge. Now, when it comes to Cameron Hodge, he was technically fired just a moment ago by X Factor, but he's like, I'm not going to leave just yet. I want to stay here and continue to watch you guys. And so that is when he realized that they have hope in two things. One, in the will of Angel, they will see something that could possibly help them continue on X Factor. And two, they also still have hope in the idea that humans and mutants can live together in harmony. And that last one right there really does bother Cameron a lot. He wants to make sure that dream never comes to life. And so he calls up somebody and tells that person it's time to go into Plan Beta. And we're left to wonder what in the world is Plan Beta? Now, on their way over to the courthouse, you do have our hero see a huge body of people standing outside the courthouse protesting. Now, this huge amount of people are really broken up into two groups. The first group is being led by a reporter known as Trish Gilby. Now, when it comes to Trish, she really hates the idea that there are mutant hunters out there. She really loves the idea that mutants can live along with humans in harmony. But with the idea of mutant hunters being out there, she really hates X Factor a lot. Now, even though our heroes are pretending, they don't know that. And so, of course, they're getting even more hatred. Now, the other group hates X Factor as well, but for a completely different reason. Because you had the X Factor team fight against the three horsemen of Apocalypse. But here's the thing, when they're out there using their powers and wearing their mutant outfits, they're not known as X-Factor, they're known as X-Terminators. And so with their battle against the four horsemen of Apocalypse and Central Park and also causing a lot of damage, you have this other group wondering where was X-Factor to stop X-Terminator, not realizing that those two groups are really the same people. But either way, once you have our heroes get inside the actual courthouse to hear the will of Angel, we come to find out the only thing mentioned is that everything he has goes over to Cameron Hodge. The money, the entire Operation X Factor, it goes straight over to Cameron Hodge. And so Cameron won. And so if our heroes want to continue on with X Factor, they're going to have to work under the man they currently hate. And so when our heroes leave the courtroom and go outside the courthouse, they are confronted by Trish. Now here's the thing, Trish does inform our heroes that she got word that Cameron Hodge was somehow able to change how the will was supposed to go, which means that there is a possibility the will was not supposed to be give everything over to Cameron Hodge. Instead, most likely give it to somebody else possibly a member of X Factor like Cyclops or Jean Grey. But the problem is though, nobody knows the actual truth. But she also says that he was the one that had told the doctors to get rid of Angel Wings. Now, before X Factor is able to get more information out of her, Cameron Hodge walks outside a courthouse where you do have our heroes inform him that they are not going to work for him at all. If they're going to continue X Factor, they're going to do it in their own kind of way. Now, right after they say that, you didn't have Cameron tell his operatives to go ahead and begin Plan Beta. And we come to find out that Plan Beta is really more the idea of spreading more hatred towards the mutant race. And what I mean by that is, out of nowhere, you have a group of people wearing battle suits yelling out, death to the mutant hunters, death to X Factor. Because again, to the public, X Factor is a group of humans who are going out of their way to hunt down mutants. And so now you have these people 
wearing robotic suits but pretending to be mutants who had came here to kill off mutant hunters. But in reality, these are operatives who are working for Cameron Hodge. Either way, because there's so much chaos, most of the people there are not able to take a good look and see, oh wait, it's a guy in a robot suit. But because, again, there's so much chaos, they're like, oh my god, we're all being attacked by some random mutants. Now, you do have X-Factor try their best to take down a few robots, but the problem is, though, they can't use their powers like they want to to help protect them and other innocent people in the area. And so, they have no choice but to go ahead and disappear. And so, they go hide in the sewers. But you have Cyclops tell Jean Grey, those guys were not mutants. They were regular people in robotic suits pretending to be mutants as a way to spread more hatred towards the mutant race. Because now they can say, look, mutants out of nowhere appeared and began to attack a random group of humans all because of some mutant hunters. That is not okay. Innocent people possibly got hurt or even worse, killed off. But right after that attack is over, Cameron Hodge is able to be interviewed by Trish and you have him continue the idea of spreading more hatred towards the mutant race by saying, look, this is another example of the idea of why mutants are so evil, why mutants should be killed off or locked away. Because look what they did. They came out of nowhere to attack a group of mutant hunters, but now innocent people who were just bystanders also got hurt as well this is not okay and that is why X Factor is around to take care of the mutant race now while he was giving out that interview well he was being watched by no other than Apocalypse and you have Apocalypse just laughing because homeboy is getting ready to send out his four horsemen to do some damage to the human race especially his latest horseman which is death and we have no idea who that person is just yet. But getting back over to the base of X Factor, we do pick up with the trainees. And remember, these were different characters that X Factor had saved and they were beginning the process of teaching them how to control their powers. But with that being said, they're back at the base watching TV and just saw what happened at the courthouse. But before they are able to actually react and have a conversation, well, more of those guys in robotic suits arrive at the base of X Factor to kill off their trainees because they are mutants. And so as we jump into the next chapter, we do pick up with our young heroes being attacked by the members of the right, the operatives working for Cameron Hodge. Now, here's the thing. Our young heroes, they're not trained for an event like this, but unfortunately, they have no choice here. If they want to survive, they're going to have to do what they can to survive. Now, when it comes to Richter, he's very important for this section. And the reason why, because Richter was captured by them in the past. When X Factor found Richter, they were freeing him from the right and those books we had to skip over. And so he knows the right very well. He knows what kind of torture they put mutants through. And so when it comes to our young heroes, they're trying to get away, but they can't. Now, you do have Caliban there as well. And when it comes to Caliban, he is one of the main team members, but unfortunately, he didn't go with the rest of them when it came to Angel's will. And the reason why, because of his body appearance. There's no way he can go out in the public and pretend that he is a human. Everyone would know right off the bat that he is a mutant. But with them being left behind at the base, it's technically up to him to help protect the young heroes. But he's taken out just like that. And this is very huge. And so we do see our heroes trying their best to make it back over to their base by using the sewers that can lead them back to their base. Except you have our heroes realize that everything happening to them 
is because of Cameron Hodge. He has been planning this for a very long time. And let's not forget that Trish, the reporter, she told Hank, aka Beast, what she kind of knew about Cameron Hodge. And so because of that, our heroes realized that when it came to Angel's will, Angel's wings, Angel's death, that was all being controlled by Cameron Hodge. The entire operation of X Factor is being controlled by Cameron Hodge. He did all of this as a way to build up more hatred towards the mutant race. And technically right now, he's winning. And they have basically helped him to win. But getting back over to the base of X Factor, we do pick up with Boom Boom. Now, Boom Boom is one of those characters I just kind of like for unknown reasons. Like, no matter what, I'm going to read a book if she's in there because honestly, she's a very funny kind of character. Either way, when it comes to Boom Boom, she has the ability to create small energy explosives to kind of use as a weapon against her enemies. Now, here's the thing. She was one of the few people that X Factor has saved and brought her over to be a trainee to kind of learn how to control her powers. But the thing was, she ran away. Matter of fact, she ran away and joined a team of characters known as the Fallen Angels. Now, that series had wrapped up by the time this book came out. And so, it was about time to bring her back over to this series. Either way, when she tries to come back to X Factor to apologize for, well, running away, she realizes that one, she's having a hard time getting inside, but once she does get inside, she realizes the entire base is being controlled by different operatives of the right. And currently, they're taking away every single young mutant who was there at the base of X Factor. Now, they're not going to take away Caliban, but everyone else. Now, while she is hiding, she also hears where they are going. And apparently, they're heading over to Arlington. Now, we have no idea what that means for right now, but for her, it must be somewhere important. And so she sneaks onto the plane as the plane begins to fly off back towards Arlington, but the plane is also holding the young mutants that had just been kidnapped. But then you have the main X Factor team arrive at their base. And when they do, they realize the entire place is completely wrecked. But on top of that, the young mutants that they were taking care of have been kidnapped. And so they realize they must have been taken by the right. Now, they do find Caliban. He was left behind. And once our older heroes are able to wake him up, he tells them, listen, I was knocked out, but I slowly regained consciousness and I heard where they were going next. They're heading over to Arlington. Now, when it comes to Iceman, he realized what that could possibly mean. Arlington in Virginia. Now, guys, real quick. I'm going to tell you, when I saw the word Arlington, I thought they meant my state, Texas, because we do have a city in Texas known as Arlington, where the Dallas Cowboys play, but I was wrong. Either way, it does tell our heroes they need to head over to Virginia to hopefully find the young mutants that have been kidnapped. But after a few hours later, we do pick up with Boom Boom. Now, when it comes to Boom Boom, she does arrive in Arlington, Virginia after following the right for a good period of time. Now, she realized that they had arrived at some kind of museum. Now, this is a museum, so to the public, it may seem like a normal place, but in reality, it's also a secret base for the right in the back offices. And so when it comes to Boom Boom, she begins to walk around the place to hopefully gather enough intel about what is currently happening inside this building. Now, while she is trying to do that, well, security realize who she is. And they're kind of like, hey, she is a mutant. And on top of that, she was saved by X Factor. She's one of the ones that we were missing. We have to go ahead and grab her right now. Except she tries to make a phone call back to New York to tell X Factor where to find her. But unfortunately, she has to run away because those few security guards are about to catch up on her. 
And so getting back over to the trainees of X Factor, well, you have the right beginning to torture them. And you have Richter inform the rest of the group what really happens when it comes to them being captured by the right. The right is planning on using mutants as weapons. And so what they try to do is torture you in different kind of ways to hopefully control you down the road to again use you as a weapon for their own personal gain. Now, real quickly, we do jump over to Apocalypse. Now, when it comes to Apocalypse, he's getting ready to send out the four horsemen. Now, let's not forget, he just got his fourth horseman, which is Death. And we have no idea who Death is, but apparently he wants to make sure that Death is ready by giving him a test. Now, when it comes to the other horsemen, they don't believe that Death is all that impressive because apparently the only ability he has is to fly. And so out of nowhere, you had his horsemen be able to clear the test with no problems at all. But we're still left to wonder who could possibly be the fourth horseman of Apocalypse. But then, getting back over to Boom Boom, she does see Richter is currently being tortured by the right. They are trying to turn him into a secret weapon, or just some kind of weapon to use against their enemies. Either way, you do have Boom Boom being able to actually save him by breaking him out of his torturing device. Now, why you have the two characters trying to get away? Well, unfortunately, they run into the leader of the entire operation, and that would be Cameron Hodge. Now, like I said earlier, though, we kind of already knew that he was part of the group. But now we know that he is actually the leader of the group. And so everything that has been going on with X Factor was being done by him. Except a few things being done by Apocalypse. And so when we jump into the final chapter for today's video, we do pick up with X Factor breaking into the actual base that belongs to the right. Now, while they are doing that, I kind of want to focus on Beast. And the reason why, because remember, Beast got really sick when it came to Pestilence touching him. And remember, Pestilence powers is to give you a random illness. Now, Beast has been able to recover, but apparently he's not able to think straight to the point where it seems like he no longer has an interest in science or possibly his mind is beginning to change into a animal state of mind. Either way, you do have our heroes continue on to hopefully find their trainees and get the heck out of there. And so when we jump over to Cameron Hodge, we see him still continuing to torture the trainees of X Factor. Now, while doing that and hoping to turn them into weapons, well, that is the moment he realized his base is being attacked by X Factor. Now, he's not worried. And the reason why? Because he planned this. He knew that sooner or later, X Factor would come after for their trainees. And so now it's him saying, okay, you know, what make sure you guard this room but i'll make sure to handle x factor so that we are able to move on to the next part of our master plan now when it comes to x factor they run into a room that was specially made for them the room is made to contain them and their powers do not work inside of there now that is the moment where they are confronted by cameron hodge now when they do see cameron he tells them that he has been planning this for a very long time. Matter of fact, ever since college. Let me explain, because remember, the only reason why he was able to join X Factor as their PR is because he was close friends with Angel, but they were friends in college. But back in college, Angel wings were not developed yet, and so he looked like a human. But once Angel had gained his wings and came out as a mutant, well, that began his hatred towards the mutant race and so ever since then he has been plotting to hopefully get rid of the mutant race either way when it comes to the room that was specially made to contain x factor well they were able to break free and once they do that they continue on to hopefully find cameron but to also find their trainees as well 
but we have to jump back over to Apocalypse. And the reason why? Because this gives us our first appearance of Archangel. Yes, you heard that right, Archangel. This was the moment where the world found out that he was still alive. And when I say the world, I meant the real world, not the comic book world. Because again, we were told back in X Factor, I want to say number 14 or 15, that Angel had committed suicide. And so to all his friends, he was dead. But we come to find out Apocalypse had saved him and turned him into his fourth horseman, Death, Archangel. Now when it comes to Archangel, you right now have him fighting against the other horsemen to only see who is the strongest. And whoever is the strongest will become the leader of the group. Now that battle right there does not take that long where you have Angel being able to defeat the other horsemen so easily to prove that he should be the leader. And so the rest of the book really does focus more on X Factor and their trainees fighting against the right. And so when we jump back over to them, we also kind of find out that Cameron Hodge is wearing a special kind of armor. And this armor protects him from Cyclops optic blast. Because when it comes to Cameron, he realized that if you take out Cyclops and Jean Grey, the rest of the X Factor team breaks apart. Like they can't function without those two members of the team, which honestly is not completely true because of Iceman. And what I mean by that is you do have the right being able to put on some kind of belt that cancels out the powers of Iceman. Now when it comes to the belt, it was technically programmed to Iceman's original stats. But let's not forget, he disappeared from the book for a short period of time and jumped over to Thor books. And when he did, Thor and Loki, really just Loki, gave Iceman a power up. And so Iceman is even more powerful than he was about almost 10 issues ago. And so when it comes to Cameron, when he made that belt, it was made for Iceman's original power level, not his new power level. And so Iceman was able to break free and then break the armor that Cameron was using. And then you have Cyclops being able to give the finishing blow. Except the problem is though, when he does that, we kind of find out Cameron was never there. Well, he was in the building, but he wasn't there when it came to our heroes fighting against him. They were fighting against a robot. The real Cameron was able to get away and most likely trying to find a new way to attack X-Factor in the mutant race. But the day is saved. X-Factor is able to leave alongside with their trainees. Now, getting back over to Apocalypse, well, he was watching X-Factor the entire time, and he has been wondering how strong they truly are. Because again, let's not forget, when it comes to Apocalypse, he's really big on the idea that the weak deserves to die, and only the strong deserves to live. And so when it comes to Apocalypse, he was watching X-Factor the entire time, and he still feels like they need more tests to see how strong they truly are. And so he does tell his horsemen, get ready, it's time to fight against X-Factor. And so while X-Factor is wondering where they can go with their trainees, out of nowhere, they are teleported away over to what seems to be the base of Apocalypse. And this leads into the fall of the mutant story arc. And so with that being What's going on there, YouTube, and welcome back to another comic book video. Okay, so we are finally here. We are going to jump into the fall of the mutant story arc. Now, this was the second crossover ever done in X-Men comics, but it was a tad bit different from the mutant massacre crossover. And what I mean by that is when it came to the mutant massacre, it was an actual 
crossover, meaning that you had all the different books being able to cross over with one another. You had X-Factor, X-Men, New Mutants, Thor, Daredevil, and also Power Pack being able to cross over into each other books. Except when it comes to Fall of the Mutants, you don't really have all these different kind of teams or characters being able to jump into each other books. The entire point of this crossover is to begin the downfall for the mutant race. And what I mean by that is, before this story arc, the mutant race was already getting a lot of hate from the human race. But at this point right here in Marvel Comics, you have the humans begin to hate the mutants even more. We hit an all-time low to the point where you're going to have new teams or new enemies pop up and try to begin the process of getting rid of the mutant race. Now, when it comes to X-Factor, their new enemy is not really a human, it's really more Apocalypse. But his goal is not to get rid of the mutants, but to get rid of the human race. But with Apocalypse being here, he's going to bring in more problems for the mutant race, rather than actually help out the mutant race. And you see what I mean as we dive into today's video. And so getting into today's storyline, we do pick up with X-Factor arriving to Apocalypse Base. Now remember, Apocalypse Base is technically this floating ship or floating spacecraft that he had basically built out of unknown technology. Now at the end of our last video, we saw X-Factor getting teleported away, but we were left to wonder where to, and now we know where they were teleported over to the base of Apocalypse. Now, when they are confronted by Apocalypse, they are kind of surprised to see him again. Because remember, the last time they saw Apocalypse, he honestly did not try to fight against them. Matter of fact, he used other mutants to fight against X-Factor. And once the battle was no longer going his way, but also his plans were beginning to fall apart, Homeboy dipped out, and our heroes were left to wonder who in the world was Apocalypse and what could he possibly be up to. But here he is again now, and he says, I want you guys to join my side because I'm trying to help out the mutant race. And what I mean by that is, when it comes to Apocalypse, he's really big on survival of the fittest. Now, that is really important because with Apocalypse, he believes that weak people do not deserve to live. Only the strong deserve to live. Now, here's the thing though. He believes that humans are weak. And so with that, they deserve to die. Now, the only reason why he thinks that because when it comes to humans, they are full of fear. They are full of hatred. They are full of greed. And that shows weakness in their blood. And so for Apocalypse, they have to go. And he is hoping that X-Factor will join his side. He has been watching them. He realized that they have gone through really different kinds of tragedies. But they had overcome those different kinds of tragedies. And so that was another example of the idea that they are strong people, strong mutants that should join his side. And so he says, your whole idea of trying to accomplish Charles Xavier's dream is stupid. There's no way that humans and mutants are going to be able to live together in harmony. So why not go ahead and join my side and help me wipe out the human race? Now, of course, you do have X Factor say no, like, hey, we are the good guys here. You're the bad guys. Why in the world would we join your side? Now, here's the thing. Apocalypse kind of knew that they were going to say no, but he still had a little bit of hope in the idea of them joining his side. But either way, he does release his three horsemen all over again to fight against our heroes. And of course, that would be war, pestilence, and famine. And so now, with those three horsemen being out there, 
they are going to fight against our heroes. Now, here is something else I do want to mention, and that would be Pestilence. Because the last time our heroes fought against the Three Horsemen, Beast got very ill because of her. Because that's her ability, to give you random illness. And so, when Beast got that, he was able to recover, but it began to make him stronger. But here comes the bad side effect. With him getting stronger, he's becoming, well, not as smart as he used to be. And so, he's technically not really thinking things through when it comes to fighting against the Four Horsemen. But either way, you have X-Factor in the Four Horsemen battle against each other. And this is Apocalypse trying to show them that, listen, I pick these guys because they are strong. They are actually capable of actually defeating you. And once they do that, I'm hoping that you realize that I'm the better choice. But to also help you get revenge against the humans. The humans were the ones who got rid of your best friend, Angel. Now remember, we had to skip over a few books. Angel had committed suicide, or we were left to believe he did. We kind of got the idea that Cameron Hodge had possibly killed off Angel and made it look like he committed suicide. But in reality, he didn't do that. But either way, you do have our heroes trying their best to fight against, well, the three horsemen. Now, as the fight goes on, you have Apocalypse kind of get tired of the idea of watching X-Factor fight against the three horsemen. Watching X-Factor be able to somewhat bounce back every single time they get knocked down by one of the three horsemen. But this is also Apocalypse saying, it's about time for me to introduce the fourth and final horseman. And that would be Archangel. Now at first, our heroes have no idea who this man is, but then Jean Grey realized who it is. It's Warrington. It's Warren. It's Angel. They're kind of like, oh my god, you're alive. Because again, they believed that he had committed suicide. Now, they kind of got the idea that Cameron Hodge had possibly killed off Angel and made it look like he committed suicide, but here he is right now. And you have Apocalypse say, I saved him. It was humans that broke this man down, took his money, took his wing, took his soul. It was me who brought him back up again. It was me to help him realize that humans deserve to be killed off. They are weak, pathetic. And that is where he comes in. He is my death horseman. And he will bring death to all humans across New York and possibly the world. Now, you do have our heroes try their best to fight against Angel. Sorry, Archangel. But they lose the battle so easily. They are defeated and then bound to these different devices to make them watch what happens next. And so we kind of find out what Apocalypse is about to do next. See, when it comes to Apocalypse, he does tell his four horsemen, it's time for you guys to go out there and attack Manhattan. It's time for you guys to begin the process of killing off the weak. Of course, killing off the humans. Now, X-Factor, they can't do anything about it. And the reason why? Because they're bound to those devices. Now, here is something else I do want to talk about. And that would be Caliban. Because remember, when it came to Angel's death, he died. And of course, he was replaced by Caliban. And Caliban was part of the Morlocks. Now, the Morlocks were a group of mutants who lived under New York in the sewers. And the reason why, because sometimes when a mutant gains their abilities, their body also changes as well, to the point where they're no longer able to hide in the public. And so, you had a group of mutants go down into the sewers to live a somewhat normal life. But the thing was, when it came to the Morlocks, 
most of them were killed off by the Marauders. Their home was lost thanks to the Marauders. And that took place back in the Mutant Massacre storyline. By the way, we do have a playlist covering that entire event. Either way, when it came to Caliban, after losing his home, he wanted to stay with X-Factor, which he did. And so he replaced Angel. Except when it came to the three horsemen and also X-Factor fighting against each other, well, everyone forgot about Caliban. And so when he reappears, our heroes believe that he is going to release them from their bound devices. But he doesn't. Instead, he says, listen, I saw what happened to Angel. He was turned into Archangel, a weapon to be used by Apocalypse against a human's race. But now I realize I want the same thing for myself as well. And so he walks over to Apocalypse and says, I want you to do the same thing you did to Archangel. Turn me into a weapon that you can use so that I am able to get revenge against the people who have hurt me. And of course, he is talking about the Marauders, the evil mutant group. And so that is his goal. And so now one of the members of X Factor has joined Apocalypse's side. And so as we dive into the next chapter, well, we do pick up with the four horsemen of Apocalypse just going on a rampage. They are literally attacking the entire city, causing damage to almost every single building in their path. Now, here is something else I do want to mention. When it comes to Apocalypse, he does begin to talk about what is happening around this point in X-Men comics. And what I mean by that is, earlier I told you guys that Fall of the Mutants is technically the beginning point of where you had the human race try to think of new kinds of ways to get rid of mutants. And so when it comes to Apocalypse, he also mentions that the American government is beginning the process of making new laws that could affect mutants to hopefully remove them from America. And so when it comes to Apocalypse, that is another reason to why to kill off the human race. Because look at them. They couldn't just adjust to us being around. They couldn't actually fight us in a fair battle. Instead, they try to make laws to get rid of us. That is a weak person kind of move. And the only reason why they are doing that because they don't fit in when it comes to the schemes of the future of evolution. And so it's Apocalypse saying that is another reason why they deserve to be killed off. Now, when it comes to X Factor, they are able to break free from the containments. And once they're able to do that, they begin to, well, do some damage to the ship that belongs to Apocalypse. Now, here's the problem, though. Our heroes have no idea how this ship actually works. And so with them just going around and just trying to wreck the entire ship, well, that begins a new problem for our heroes because now the ship is beginning to absorb all light and energy from Manhattan, which could be a very huge problem down the road for our heroes. Now, because it did cause a lot of damage to the actual aircraft, you do have Jean Grey and Cyclops be thrown off the actual aircraft. And unfortunately, they can't find their way back onto it because on the outside of the aircraft, well, it looks invisible. You can't see it. And so our heroes are wondering, what in the world can they do next? And you have Cyclops say, well, we have to focus on the four horsemen because they are continuing to attack Manhattan. Now, when it comes to Iceman and Beast, they're still on the aircraft that belongs to Apocalypse. And so you have our two heroes wonder, what can they do on the aircraft? How can they stop Apocalypse? And so you then have Jean Grey try to have a conversation with one of the four horsemen of Apocalypse. And that would be Feynman, better known as Autumn. That is her real name. Now, here's the thing about Autumn, though. Jean Grey realized that she is a young girl who was most likely tricked 
by Apocalypse to join his side. Because when it comes to Feynman, or Autumn, she was a young girl that had an eating disorder. Now the reason why she had an eating disorder, because of her mutant ability. Where every single time she would try to touch food, it would just turn to dust. She was basically destroying any kind of meal that was put in front of her, which of course led to her being unable to actually eat. And so with that all being said, she gained an eating disorder. But Apocalypse said, I can help fix that for you. I can help control your powers, but at the same time, you will be able to eat again. Now with all that being said, is Jean Grey trying to help her realize that she's helping out an evil mutant. But for her sake, it's kind of like he's helping me out. He's actually helping me control my powers. Now in the middle of their battle, she is actually teleported away into a Captain America book, which does tie into the fall of the mutant storyline. Now we do jump over to Cyclops who's fighting against war, one of the four horsemen of Apocalypse. Now when it comes to war, we actually saw him in the mutant massacre event where Apocalypse appeared to recruit him. Because remember, he was a soldier that was seriously injured. He was paralyzed from the neck down. Now of course, thanks to Apocalypse, he was able to repair his body where we come to find out that War has the ability to cause explosions by clapping his hands. Now when it comes to War, the reason why he wants to kill off the humans is because he was a soldier that was seriously injured. And the American government is not giving out any kind of money to help other soldiers who are in need. Instead, most of their money goes into creating more weapons to help them win wars across the world. And so for war, the Four Horsemen of Apocalypse, he believes that the human race deserves to be killed off. Because how do you not care about other people who are suffering? That is not okay at all. Now, when it comes to war, he is stopped by Cyclops. And once he's stopped by Cyclops, you have Jean Grey and Cyclops being able to regroup. And so we jump back over to Iceman and Beast trying their best to fight against Apocalypse. Now, here's the thing though. When it comes to Apocalypse, he's trying to warn them that the more damage they do to his aircraft, the most likely this aircraft is going to crash into Manhattan, causing a lot of damage across the city. And so even though he tells our heroes that by the time he does, it's too late. Beast and Iceman done a lot of damage and you had the aircraft beginning to hit different buildings in Manhattan. And so we jump back over to Cyclops and Jean Grey who are on the outside of the aircraft and just watching this aircraft begin to hit buildings left and right. And that is a huge problem. Now when it comes to our heroes on the outside, they want to find a way to help out Iceman and Beast. But unfortunately, they can't do that because they are confronted by Archangel. And here's the thing, Archangel is trying to kill them and Jean Grey is not trying to fight back because she still believes that her best friend, the man that she almost fell in love with is still inside there somewhere, that she may have the ability to actually reach him. Now, when it comes to Cyclops, he's more saying no, our friend is gone. We have no choice here. We have to go ahead and fight against our old best friend. Now, while you have our two heroes trying their best to fight against both death, but also fight against pestilence, well, that is the moment you have the power pack arrive to help out X-Factor to fight against the horsemen of Apocalypse, but to also make sure the aircraft does not crash into Manhattan. Now, you're probably wondering, hey, Fresh, who in the world is the power pack? Now, we saw them back in the Mutant Massacre storyline. They only had one chapter and that was it. But when it comes to Power Pack, they are a group of kids, children, who had received powers from an alien. That's all you really need to know about Power Pack. 
because every once in a while they do have a crossover with the X-Men. Like again, for example, The Mutant Massacre. And they also have a chapter in this crossover as well. Either way, they had just arrived in time to help X-Factor find a way to defeat the Four Horsemen of Apocalypse, but to also make sure that aircraft does not crash into Manhattan. And so once you have everybody being able to get back on the aircraft, you do have Archangel trying his best to kill off his old friends. Now it does lead into the moment where he does cut Iceman in half. Now real quick, this was still the era where we had no idea how Iceman powers truly worked. And so we're still trying to figure out how powerful he really was. And so even though Archangel had cut Iceman in half, well he was in his ice form. And so he is able to put himself back together. But you have Iceman tell Archangel, hey man listen, I wanted you to believe that you had killed me off because I knew my death would break you out of apocalypse control. And honestly, it works. And so you have Archangel no longer trying to be a horseman of Apocalypse. Now, when it comes to the aircraft of Apocalypse, so much damage was done, it is for sure about to crash into Manhattan. And so you have Apocalypse wanting to leave with his two horsemen and his new recruitment. And that would be Caliban, because remember, Caliban wants revenge against the people who had destroyed his home, which was the Marauders. And so he is hoping that Apocalypse will be able to give him the same upgrade like he did for Archangel. And so why you have Apocalypse leave? Archangel is no longer a horseman of Apocalypse, but now Caliban is. But on top of that, this aircraft is about to crash into Manhattan. Now, luckily for our heroes, they were able to crash the aircraft into the Hudson River. Now, after doing that, they're then confronted by a bunch of reporters. Now, like I said earlier, when it comes to the fall of the mutant story arc, this is the beginning point where you have the humans begin the process of trying to find more ways to get rid of mutants. The hatred towards mutants has now reached an all new high. And so as soon as X-Factor gets out of the aircraft, they are instantly blamed for what happened to the Hudson River with the aircraft crashing inside of it. But you have Cyclops say, no, it wasn't us. It was an evil mutant. But here's the thing, we are X Factor and we are here to basically tell you that no matter what, we are going to try to make sure that humans and mutants can live together in harmony. You may hate us, but we don't hate you. And so please allow us to show you the right way when it comes to treating us because we are also humans. Yes, we are mutants, but we are still humans of Earth. And so this is Cyclops saying, only judge us for what we have done. Don't judge us for who we are. Now that ends X-Factor issue number 25. And so getting into the next chapter is actually going to be a tie-in from the Power Pack series. And we pick up with issue number 35. Now guys, remember, when it comes to Power Pack, they were a group of children that had received powers from an alien. And then with those powers, they became a young superhero team. Now when it comes to their parents, they have no idea that their children is actually a group of superheroes. Now something else I do want to mention about this tie-in most of this chapter takes place before the last chapter. Because remember, in the last chapter, Power Pack appeared out of nowhere to help X-Factor fight against the Four Horsemen of Apocalypse. But the question was, where in the world did they come from? This book right here answers that question for us. And so when we jump into this chapter, we do pick up with Power Pack being grounded. Yes, you heard that right. They are grounded. Now, not all of them. Really, only the older siblings are grounded. And matter of fact, the youngest one, 
Katie, she makes fun of her siblings for being grounded. And with them being grounded, unfortunately, they, all they can do is just read their books and watch whatever that she is watching on TV. Now, their parents are not home at the moment. And this is going to lead us into how in the world they got involved in the Fall of the Mutant story arc. Because while at home, you do have their father call them and say, hey, where is your mother? I have been trying to get a hold of her. And you have the kids say, hey, dad, mom is not here. Matter of fact, mom is back in the city riding the subway. She might be home very soon. But the problem is there is a blackout. Now, this blackout is being caused because what is happening between X Factor and Apocalypse. And so with this battle out there happening, you have the entire city losing energy left and right. And matter of fact, when it came to the last chapter, you had Apocalypse tell our heroes with them trying to destroy his aircraft, well, it began to absorb energy and light, which means that it began to cause blackouts all over the city. Now, when it comes to the power pack, they begin to get very worried about their mother, who's out there in the city that currently has no power. But on top of that, you have the news reports come in on the radio talking about what is happening in the city, with X Factor fighting against the four horsemen of of apocalypse and there are places getting blown up left and right because of those battles and so you have power pack begin to get worried about their mother now they realize they can't leave because they are grounded well you have katie say i'm not grounded and i want to make sure that our mother is okay and so she leaves the house to go look for her mother now, when it comes to Katie, she is able to find a subway train that her mother is on. But that subway train is currently being attacked by pestilence. And remember, she is one of the horsemen of Apocalypse, and she has the ability to give you a random illness. And so, of course, we see her right now giving everyone on that subway train some random disease. Now, you do have Katie try to jump in and fight against pestilence. But the problem is, though, Pestilence is able to touch her, and of course, that begins the process of seeing young Katie getting very sick, and so she has no choice but to run away, but luckily, she was able to have Pestilence stop attacking the train that her mother was on. Now, when it comes to the rest of Power Pack, the way they get involved in this mess is that they get very concerned about their younger sister, but also their mother. And more and more reports are coming in about what is happening in the city. And so you have our young heroes say, we have to go out there and find our sister and find our mother as well. Now, here's the thing, because as soon as they say that, they see Apocalypse aircraft flying over them and they realize okay some things are popping off right now in the city and we got to at least help out where we can and so they leave to go find their sister first now once they are able to find their sister they realize there's something wrong with her we already know what it is because she was touched by pestilence and so you have the other members of the family try to heal her up now at first they're also being affected by whatever disease that she had received from pestilence. It's very contagious. But once you have the power pack come together and use the combination of their powers, they were able to heal her and themselves up just like that. And then they realize they got to go help out with X Factor when it comes to fighting against the four horsemen of Apocalypse. Now, we can technically skip over the next section, and the reason why, because it picks up where we saw in the last chapter, where you had X-Factor and Power Pack work together to fight against the Four Horsemen of Apocalypse. Now, at the end of that battle, you had X-Factor tell the kids to go help out in other areas, because right now, a lot of people are being affected by this battle, while you have X-Factor go back onto the aircraft to have one last battle with Apocalypse. And so getting into the next section of the story, we see that Power Pack was the reason why Apocalypse aircraft has landed in the Hudson River. Now remember, we saw X Factor in the last chapter land that thing, but apparently it was thanks to the Power Pack team that kind of 
helped out with the idea of the ship not crashing into the Statue of Liberty. And so that's really important for them because they did help out and they did save a lot of lives and also save the lives of most likely X-Factor as well. And really, their chapter ends with them being able to get home in time before their mother had arrived back at home to make it seem like they never left at all. And that's really it for their chapter. And this is where we are going to end the first part of our coverage over the fall of the mutants. The next video is going to contain two more tie-ins, one for Captain America and one for the Hulk as well. And then we jump back into the main storyline once again with X-Factor. But with that being said, guys, please leave me a like down below and subscribe. But guys, see y'all next time. Later.